Welcome to Extreme in the Mainstream. This is a presentation by the Gail Borden Public Library. And uh, just go to our webpage, www.gailborden.info slash events for more events that we will be doing uh, virtually in these pandemic days. And uh, as you all log on, um, let me just uh, go ahead and uh, let you know that there will be a Q&A session afterwards. And I've learned now from various Zoom experiences, if I tell everybody to put their questions in the Q&A, you all use chat and vice versa. So we'll monitor both. So do whatever uh, moves you. Uh, we're up to 22. Uh, I think we're stabilizing a bit. So let me just uh, go ahead and formally welcome everybody. I'm Tish Kalimer, Community Engagement Manager here at Gail Borden Public Library. And part of our mission is to bring programs that educate and inform people on current issues uh, with the desire that as we are civically engaged, uh, we have the knowledge and the information to take action, think about things, talk to our neighbors, uh, come up with our, our own thought processes about very important issues. So Extreme in the Mainstream was born when we started to notice all of these groups, such as the Proud Boys, the Boogaloo, the Bass. Extremist groups are now in the news. They, they popped up in the, one of the presidential debates. They are no longer lurking in the shadows. So we are very excited to have a, a panel of, uh, excuse me, a panel of experts uh, here today. Uh, first, we have our moderator, Jeanette Afif, who is a, a local Elgin attorney. And then we have Dr. Elizabeth Yates, uh, who's a senior researcher at the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism at the University of Maryland. We have David Goldenberg, who is the um, Midwest Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League. And then we have our community uh, contributors, Rabbi Margaret Frisch Klein of Congregation Knesset Israel here in Elgin, and City Councilwoman Tish Powell. So welcome everyone, and I will hand it off to Junaid. All right, thank you very much uh, to Tish uh, and, and Sadia and the Gail Borden Public Library for uh, organizing this event. And um, so uh, just to build uh, off a little bit on what um, Tish uh, said about sort of why we decided to put this together. Um, you know, for a long time, we talked about hidden spaces of hate. In fact, uh, a couple years ago, um, we brought uh, to Gail Borden Library a gentleman named Pete Simi. He's a, a professor at Chapman University. He wrote this book about hidden spaces of hate, the American swastika. And um, recently, I heard uh, one of our panelists, David Goldenberg, say in an interview that, um, you know, the things that used to be dog whistles, they're not dog whistles anymore. You know, they're, they're, they're uttered in, you know, openly and plainly. Uh, a few years ago, we had that march in Virginia where people said, um, you know, they were marching and they said, uh, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. They didn't have masks on, they didn't have hoods on. They openly said, Jews will not replace us. Their anti-Semitism was not veiled, it was plain sight. We have people who are now burning swastikas and, you know, um, giving the Sikh Heil uh, salute and, and happy to be photographed doing it. Um, that is, you know, the world that we are starting to live in now. Um, and uh, I wanted to also point out that um, like back in 2013, a uh, professor, Dr. Uh, uh, Ari uh, Perliger, he wrote in this research that he um, did while he was at the, um, uh, combating Terrorism Center at West Point. And um, he wrote, it's not only feeling deprivation that motivates those involved in far-right violence, but also the sense of empowerment that emerges when political system, when the political system is perceived to be increasingly permissive of far-right ideas. And he wrote that back in 2013. And of course, from 2016 to now, we've seen that um, this extremism has clearly been brought into the mainstream. And um, so the way we're gonna do today's session is we're going to have Dr. Elizabeth Yates and David Goldenberg speak first and second. Dr. Yates is going to talk about 
uh, you know, her research on domestic radicalization and far right extremism. David Goldenberg is going to add color. He is the uh, regional director of the uh, Midwest office of the Anti-Defamation League. And um, he's going to talk about the work that ADL does vis-a-vis -vis extremism and hate. And then, as Tish mentioned, our um, city councilwoman Tish Powell and Margaret Frisch Klein, rabbi at Congregation Kenneseth Israel, are going to add color because they represent two communities that are have historically been um, the largest victims of hate and uh, violence in the United States. That is the Jewish community and the Black American community. And then we will open it up for Q&A and discussion amongst the panelists. So um, right off the bat, we will have Dr. Elizabeth Yates, a senior researcher on domestic terrorism at the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism at the University of Maryland. Uh, the acronym there is START. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Yates. You would think it's my first Zoom call uh, in pandemic. That is not accurate. But um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Uh, it's obviously an incredibly difficult time, but one of the small you know, positives of this is that we do get to uh, be a part of conversations that we probably wouldn't have had a chance to participate in. So. That's great, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you all today. Um, and especially with such a broad panel, it's really cool. I really like to see that you know diversity of experiences, and it's really cool. I, I like that a lot. So um, I am going to start here by uh, basically I, I was actually given a pretty I would say ambitious uh, uh, request to to what to I'm going to speak to today, but I'm going to try to do as much as I can. Um, let's just let me pull up my slides here. Yes. Okay. So that's fine. Sorry. Okay. So the title of my uh, talk today is called Data Trends in the Current Wave of Far Right Extremism. Um, I, uh, I do come from the center, uh, the START Center. I won't repeat the non acronym because none of you should ever have to remember it. It's long. We do acronyms a lot. Uh, but we are, I will just tell you a little bit about who we are at the University of Maryland. We are an independent research center. We were founded uh, after 9-11 with the goal of trying to facilitate the relationship between academics who are working on data and really trying to insert in empirical uh, information into public policy debates around terrorism. Uh, we've expanded a lot since then. I work primarily on extremism, terrorism. We have people doing disinformation research, that kind of thing. Um, we're no longer, uh, this actually is a little bit old, it should say we are a, uh, we're an emeritus center um, of excellence from Homeland Security, but we do get a lot of federal grants, um, but we are an independent center. So uh, we really, our, our goal is to try to create data that is objective and reliable and can sort of serve as tests um, to try to understand the observations and the ideas that we have about extremism and terrorism as we're seeing it. Um, so yeah, I do a lot of talks with this kind of not thrilling, but but hopefully um, informing title. So I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to basically focus on showing data to look at what the current wave of extremism looks like and how it's different from other waves, or I'm sorry, how it's different from uh, previous waves and also just the way that we've seen far right extremism in the US, especially recently. Um, I'm going to start really quickly by contextualizing it a little bit just to show and I'm a sociologist. Um, and so I'm always thinking about things in sort of broad social trends right. And so when I look today at what is unquestionably a wave of violent far right white supremacist extremism. This is something that has a lot in common with the previous waves we've seen before. So I'm not gonna go into a ton of details about all of these ones I listed here, but I do think it's important to understand what this has in common is that throughout the history of the United States, we've seen these waves of white supremacist violence um, and organizing emerge specifically in reaction to uh, moments when uh, white, especially male, straight, Christian dominance, uh, political, economic, cultural was being challenged in different ways, right? So immediately after the Civil War um, in the 1920s, that was of course, you know, very um, anti-Black in the 1920s, we saw huge waves of Klan organizing, you know, some say up to 4 million 
uh, clan members uh, organizing, especially in the Midwest and um, in country in uh, states like Pennsylvania, uh, that were very anti-immigrant, very anti-Catholic, um, and also, of course, very anti-Semitic and anti-Black as well. In the 60s, in the reaction to the civil rights movement, and then the 90s, you had this skinhead sort of emerge. Um, and then I would say I put 2012 here because that's when our data starts to show a growth in terrorism, but it might even be a little bit earlier than that, that we can sort of say this is the, the beginning wave of what has been um, large a growth in the organizing and violence perpetrated by white supremacists, anti-government extremists, and other um, extremists that we typically describe as, as on the right, as on the far right. Um, and I would say there are a lot of reasons for this. I know we've talked about some of them already. Uh, I would say that, you know, especially in order to understand it as one of these other waves, that one of the, the driving um, animators here is this reaction to this idea of a minority majority or the demographic changes in the United States. And I'll talk about a little bit in Western Europe also. Um, that's something that we've seen uh, extremists start to talk about mobilized for generations, decades, but especially in recent moments. Um, and so there are a lot of other factors on the you know, national level scale that impact that also. This is all political violence. It is intimately connected to the political system. And so the kind of mainstreaming of extremist ideas and rhetoric that you know, permeates uh, political discourse certainly has an impact on uh, their economic factors as well. So um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the specific trends we see, what makes this different from a data perspective. Okay, um, one more thing, I guess, a little bit of background. So this is some data from a, one of the data sets I work on. Um, and what we've done here is we created a sample of extremists, ideological extremists in the United States. And so our definition here, and this is for almost all of our data sets, is based on sort of behavior rather than exclusively ideology, right? So in order to qualify for, you know, uh, inclusion in this data set, what we say is that, you know, you have to have uh, broken the law and especially to have been violent to count here, right? So we are, we are not, we don't do a great job of tracking things like uh, flyering around the country or, you know, especially harassment that may not go accounted for, reported to law enforcement. Um, but in any case, this is sort of a snapshot across time of what extremism, uh, illegal extremism, and especially violent extremism in the United States looks like. So even as I say that we're facing and, and experiencing this wave of white supremacist and far-right extremism, those kinds of ideas uh, and actions by those groups have been present throughout history and even recently. So, you know, we do say a lot like this is everyone's noticing it. They're absolutely, you know, I think by pretty much any measure a jump in this kind of activity it's been something that's been present in our society for a very long time. This is not brand new at all. Um, you can see here, uh, you know, there was greater activity maybe by the far left in the 70s. The, this is a look at, you know, this is especially capturing some of the sort of weather underground, left associated um, terrorist groups. It is certainly undercounting what we call the far right in that moment. And, and I, I guess I should say, I really mean white supremacist, anti-government, some of the folks that identify themselves on the right with extremist ideas. Um, but it's been a large part of organizing for a long time. So even as Islamist extremism started to become a, you know, a bigger factor in uh, our, you know, the national picture here, we continue to see the far right being a very act, playing a very active role in, in um, violence and extremism in the United States. Um, but it also, uh, far right extremism also tends to be some of the most violent. So it typically, our, our data shows it's more violent than far left extremists who are more likely to be arrested for things like property damage or, um, you know, sort of environmental um, or ego terrorism, which doesn't tend to target people, whereas the far right is much more likely to be engaged in uh, violence targeting people. So that's one thing that our data shows very clearly too. So I always wanna give that background to say, okay, this is something we need to think about, but this is not brand new, which means that we're also not gonna solve it immediately or address it, right? These factors have been a part of our society for a very long time and they will continue to be so no matter what happens in the immediate you know, political economic context. Okay, so a couple of things. One is just the jump in terrorist attacks. Uh, perpetrated by groups associated with the far right or individuals associated with the far right. So I have here, and again, this is all preliminary, which is why I'm I'm a, uh, I'm actually going on parental leave in five weeks. So I'm trying to get this all out. So they're particularly boring uh, data points or um, 
slides today, but what this shows you is just the astronomical growth in what, what we would describe as terrorist attacks uh, in the last, you know, especially six or seven years. So the red is basically Western Europe. It's Western Europe, New Zealand, Australia. And it, there's a huge spike in 2015 here. And if you see, look on this, uh, the y-axis here, you know, this is over hundred attacks. What this is really driven by is a tax on refugee centers. Um, that was just, that is something that we have seen just explode in terms of uh, violence perpetrated by the far right or far right actors in the last few years. That has been a major target in Europe, especially, um, and certainly in the US, but you know, we just haven't had the same numbers of uh, refugees here. So we have not seen that kind of violence. So it might look, this brown down here is the US, it might look like not such a big deal. It's pretty small, right? But you know, if you're looking over here, what the N is, that's 20 attacks, right? So for years, we would see a couple of attacks by the far right. And then you started to see them jump and jump and they have not gone back down, right? So this is a very clear trend. Um, another one that we've seen in the sort of transformation in this moment is a serious growth um, in the percentage of anti-Muslim, Arab refugee kind of attacks where people are targeting people that they perceive to be Muslim or Middle Eastern or Arab. Um, not all attacks on refugee centers are necessarily one actually attacking uh, Middle Eastern Muslim people. Uh, but, uh, you know, we know from the rhetoric and from, you know, the information that we do have about perpetrators, that's usually the driving animus. Um, and so in Europe, that's been a really, you know, that's been one of the driving forces in far right extremism and far right terrorism for a long time. It's dips and changes here a little bit, probably based on data collection issues, but uh, basically it's, it's been the driving factor for a long time, right? Um, or one, I'm sorry, of course, uh, there are others also, but that has grown in the United States. That didn't, immediately after 9-11, that was an issue. And of course it's continued to, to play a role, but it's become much more common and a much more stable component of extremism in the US. And that is a little bit different than um, some previous waves. But just to put that in context, uh, here we're looking at anti-Black attacks in the United States compared to other types of far-right attacks. This says other, it should be far-right attacks. And you can see that even as anti-Black attacks have maybe decreased as a percentage of overall far-right attacks, uh, here they are in blue, they're still going up, right? So pretty much every, every kind of target, every kind of community that has been impacted, that is directly impacted by, these, by this growth uh, has, has continued to face more and more violence and, and attacks. So that's true of, um, you know, typically of anti-Semitic attacks, even anti-abortion attacks, that kind of thing. They've all continued generally to grow. Um, and then another thing I wanna show, and this is not a great depiction of it, but another major transformation is uh, the growth of far-right mass casualty attacks. So we define that as here, especially, we define that as an attack that uh, killed more four or more people. And frankly, that was just something we didn't see from the far right for a long time. So, you know, if you're an observer and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I keep hearing about these horrible tragedies one after the other perpetrated by these neo Nazis or these white supremacists, this is not something I was seeing before. That's absolutely true, right? These are very small numbers one, two, three, and four but they absolutely, they just weren't happening to anywhere near the scale that they are now. They're happening, you know, every few months, a couple times a year. And what this doesn't capture, and we should have some data that does capture it later, is the thwarted attacks. So just the numbers of typically young white men getting arrested for uh, planning attacks on political targets, on um, uh, religious, especially, and uh, racial minorities, that kind of thing. Uh, that have been thwarted or that people have turned them in that, or they get arrested on weapons charges, maybe all of that has, has also grown. So this is something that, again, it just didn't characterize far-right extremism. It typically, it, it doesn't characterize far-left extremism right now. Um, and it was seen as, you know, typically more of an Isl Islamist extremism tactic, and it's absolutely become um, a threat uh, in the far-right. So I'm just going to look at a couple of the different recent mass casualty attacks that unfortunately I know we all have spent a lot of time thinking about and reading about in recent years and talk about how some of those, how those attacks reflect some of the, the data points that I've talked about. So um, on the top corner over here, you can see this gun, which and I'm sorry, this is, you know, I, I assume that everyone who came to this knew that this would be a very difficult conversation, but um, 
I probably should have warned you ahead of time that I was going to show you a, a picture of an actual gun used in something so horrific and violent. But this, uh, I'm doing that in order to illustrate some of the trends that I've shown before. So one is one that these are all mass casualty attacks, right? Again, we just didn't see this the same way. We've got a representation of the uh, Christchurch shooting in 2019, which killed uh, 51 people and injured 40, um, at targeting two mosques in New Zealand, Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, the El Paso attack in only, what, six months later, uh, seven or eight months later, uh, which killed 21 and I believe injured 21, uh, targeting uh, Latinx population typically, uh, or especially in um, El Paso, Texas. And then the Tree of Life shooting in 27, uh, 2018, which killed uh, 11 people and wounded six obviously targeting uh, Jewish people. And then Dylan Roof in 2015, which was one of the earlier sort of types of this attack, um, uh, who targeted African-Americans, uh, I believe killing nine um, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So what these all have in common, uh, these horrific events have in common is of course that they are mass casualty attacks. Again, a real departure from what we saw outside of Timothy McVeigh, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, another one is they were all guns. They were, you know, using um, semi-automatic or automatic uh, guns as opposed to, you know, bombs or other kind of terrorist uh, tactics that were used previously more. Um, they all targeted different minority populations or, I mean, uh, different, you know, uh, demographics. Uh, but at the same time, they all did share uh, a, a driving factor here, which is a sort of xenophobia, which we've seen uh, is more and more prominent, as I mentioned before, especially anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, Middle Eastern sentiment is increasingly present in uh, white supremacist violence and, and rhetoric. And so I, I wanna illustrate that a little bit because I think it's not always obvious. So if you look at Dylan Roof here at the bottom, this picture of him, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen it. He's holding a Confederate flag. He targeted uh, the, you know, the long-term, the very, the, the unfortunately uh, one of the, the main targets of white supremacist violence in the United States, um, black Americans in a black church, which of course is symbolic for the you know, incredibly important organizing role that black churches have had in American history. Um, and so he really couched it in this very sort of white supremacist typical American United States focused attack uh, but if you look at his writing and his rhetoric, he really was drawing on a lot of transnational and international uh, propaganda and rhetoric. So he mentioned, you know, colonialism, uh, apartheid states in uh, Africa that he, uh, you know, thought were examples of modern, uh, should be examples of a white supremacist society. He also, uh, in his sort of manifesto and later in his writing in jail, um, explicitly referenced refugee populations in Europe. Um, and sort of basically said that he thought they were analogous to Latinx populations in the United States at the time. So uh, that does illustrate another dimension here, which we see is the transnational, not only organizing, but the transnational sort of rhetoric and shared ideas that we see growing. And we weren't talking about this as much in 2015, but it has always been a component of the far right, um, but we're seeing it more and more. Um, we see this also, of course, in um, the attack on the Tree of Life. It, this was attack uh, targeting, uh, you know, two Jewish congregations in Pittsburgh. Um, unfortunately, uh, anti-Semitism has long been a, uh, a central driver, uh, especially of conspiracy theories on the far right. Um, we have some data coming out from a, a hate crimes database looking at the difference between nonviolent violent offenders and mass casualty offenders. And one of the things we found was that uh, Jewish targets represented 38% of mass casualty attacks uh, of our hate crimes database, which is obviously an incredible overrepresentation for the population, but also even just for the targets of hate crimes. So um, there are probably a lot of reasons for that, but one of them I think is that anti-Semitism has often been one of the conspiratorial grounds of you know the sort of most uh, extreme ideologues who have to, there's some evidence that white supremacists, you know, might come into these organizations with 
general sort of white racism or ideas like that, um, but they have to learn the conspiracy theories. Um, and that's something, uh, especially the, the uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and that's something that ends up and undergirding a large portion of these attacks. So for example, here, um, Robert Bowers uh, targeted Jewish targets and also said that it was because he believed that uh, there were Jewish congregations there that were supporting um, refugee and immigrants in the United States generally. So that's consistent with this sort of long recycled versions of these ideas that um, there are elites and uh, sometimes that's explicitly Jewish uh, people and sometimes not, but that are orchestrating these kinds of uh, uh, demographic change, that kind of thing. So then we saw that explicitly referenced um, by a conspiracy theory described as the great replacement in Christ Church. Um, that killer uh, killed 51 people, as I mentioned, and then he that manifesto was directly referenced and copied in some ways in the El Paso shooting uh, eight months later. So uh, again, the uh, Christchurch shooting uh, targeted uh, Muslim populations there. Um, and then in El Paso, the shooter was Patrick Crisrius was focused on Latinx populations, but he basically said, I see my views and my beliefs mirrored in this attack in uh, New Zealand, and I see the Latinx population, you know, as the target population that, that I should be focused on here. So in some ways, even though these all targeted very different communities, they also were linked by these fears of demographic change, um, conspiracy theories about elites manipulating and intentionally driving these changes about baseless conspiracy theories about uh, white Americans, however they define that, which shifts and changes a lot, uh, losing their political economic dominance in some ways. Um, and another thing that they all had in common, especially the, the latter three, the more recent three, is that they are drawing on a kind of rhetoric that we do see in mainstream today, right? So um, especially some of them seem to have radicalized pretty quickly. Uh, these are people who are accessing this kind of thing online. Um, they're not necessarily involved in, you know, these neo-Nazi skinhead groups. Uh, some of these people had some interactions online, but they were all lone actors. They were all people who were able to, um, you know, consume content either in the mainstream or in extremist sites and, and pretty much mobilize largely independently. So that's another very uh, concerning and scary thing that we've seen. So again, those are some of the data points. I could always provide more graphs and data points. I'm happy to talk about some of the nuances there. Um, and again, this is just one dimension of far-right extremism, this kind of violence. I, I think, you know, there's pretty much a lot of evidence to suggest that we've seen growth in other areas as well. Um, so I hope that we can talk about that more too. Um, but I don't know how long I've talked, but I'm gonna stop and pass it along to the many other people here. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Yates. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna uh, introduce, I'm gonna introduce David Goldenberg. He's the regional director uh, for the Midwest office of the Anti-Defamation League. Um, he, he can talk about the ADL uh, uh, in, in more detail in the context of the work he does. But um, for those uh, who don't know, it was established in uh, 1913 to address and combat anti-Semitism. And um, it has, uh, its work today addresses uh, hate and violence and um, discrimination against, um, you know, a broad sector of um, minority communities. David is, uh, uh, you know, um, he has over uh, 20 years of experience. He comes from a uh, background of um, working in uh, national public affairs and strategic advisory work. And um, before that, uh, he started his career in uh, the Michigan State uh, Senate, I think. Um, and so uh, go blue or, or go Spartans. Uh, I'm not sure which one he's uh, a fan of, but uh, uh, our family is connected to Michigan too. So um, with that, I will turn it over to David Goldenberg. David, maybe before you start, or maybe as a piece of what you do, in the chat, the question has come up, could somebody give a succinct definition of extremism. Mm. Absolutely, and, and I can touch on that. Um, you know, I, I certainly, and Dr. Yates can add some, but real briefly, I would just say that, um, and I, I responded in, in the Q&A pasting ADL's definition of extremism. 
Um, but we look at it as really extreme ideologies who are, tip are typically looking for some type of radical change, um, typically in government, religion, society. Um, it doesn't mean that necessarily all extremist movements are bad, um, abolitionists, for, ex for example, um, and others, but typically they tend to, um, it's usually defined not only kind of in the, out in the ultimate goal, but it is also defined in many ways to, uh, with the tools and tactics that they use um, to achieve uh, their ultimate goals. So that would be kind of a, a quick and sort of concise definition. Dr. Yates, I don't know if you wanna add anything, but, um, and then if not, I can go into my presentation. Yeah, I'll just say really quick, I, I apologize, I've already talked a lot, but um, yeah, it's difficult because I especially see that in the question here, you're drawing a really good point about this is really always relative, right? And so as ideas and understandings change in society and become more and less common, you know, we might, what was called extremism at one point might not be later. Um, so sometimes we use different versions, but generally in, in the work that we do, um, as I said, we really focus on illegal activity and particularly violent activity. Um, and sometimes that is based around ideas that may be more broadly shared in the population. Um, that's something that we need to think about, I think, as citizens. Um, but you know, typically uh, we typically find that most of the extremists, uh, you know, especially far right, are, are folks operating around uh, on, around ideolog ideologies that are you know more outside of the norm. So yeah, advancing radical change, which could be something like, a, you know, a, a white ethno state or something like that. So yeah, it's it's not perfect. Um, so but I appreciate you asking that question. Okay. Well, why don't I go ahead and just, um, I'm going to quickly share my screen. I'm going to put some, uh, I'm kind of go through this, hopefully everyone can see it. Um, and so I want to take just a couple minutes um, and thank the library for having me. Um, and uh, Janae uh, had talked a little bit about ADL and I'll give the, the 30, I'll give the quick and dirty of kind of two minute uh, summary of the work that we do. Um, but ADL was actually founded in Chicago in 1913 um, with a dual pronged mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. And we take that second part of our mission um, very seriously because our feeling is, is that you can't fight or eliminate one ism or obia um, without dealing with all of them. Um, and often when you're dealing with, shall we say, haters, um, their hate is not necessarily mutually exclu exclusive. While it may have roots in certain areas, um, if they tend to hate one group, whether it be minorities, Jews, Blacks, Latinos, whomever, um, they tend to hate them all. Um, and that's what we tend, we, what we typically find. The EDL really fights kind of four things. We fight anti-Semitism, we fight bigotry and bias, we, start, we, start, we fight extremism, and we fight cyber hate. And we do it through three real main things. Number one, we do it through investigations and research. ADL's Center on Extremism is among the nation and the world's leading trackers of extremism. Um, and uh, we actively work um, in many cases, sometimes to actually infiltrate extremist networks online or in real life, um, where we expose and monitor the work that they're doing and the steps that they're taking. And we actually um, provide assist to, to law enforcement when we figure out if someone has intent, if someone has capability, and if we can figure out where they are, we ultimately will um, expose them. We had more than 600 assists to law enforcement last year. We have had more than 900 already this year. Um, we've stopped incidents from occurring um, by working with them in, in tips to law enforcement. We also do it through education and training in schools, through professional development, through peer-to-peer -peer training with students um, that works on anti-bias. Um, work. We also do it through um, helping law enforcement. Um, we do it through helping them with implicit bias training um, and, uh, and also uh, through trainings on extremism, white supremacy and hate, and hate crimes as well. And lastly, we do it through advocacy and assist. So we provide um, assistance to people who are victims of bias-based incidents, not just anti-Semitism, but all bias-based incidents. Um, and we do it through advocacy, advocacy for civil rights legislation, for equal rights re legislation, religious freedom legislation, uh, and so on and so forth. So, I want to talk, I'm going to cover data really briefly, um, but I wanted to kind of put some things in, in, in the, uh, out there to kind of, you know, maybe build on what Dr. Yates was sharing. So ADL tracks the number of anti-Semitic incidents around the country. And when, we, when I say incidents, we don't define them just as sort of what we would consider to be a hate crime, but instead they are um, harassment, vandalism, and assaults. 
And so what we saw in 2019 was more than 2,000 anti-Semitic incidents, which was the highest number that you can see that we had um, in the history of ADL tracking, which by the way, has been almost 45 years. This year, we are going to blow through that number, unfortunately. And it was a 66% increase since 2016. Here in the Midwest, we're talking about 136% increase um, in the Midwest um, states. So just to kind of give you a sense from a data and statistics, here are just some pictures. Um, and I apologize for the, um, for the images, but I wanted to put these up here. Um, and then just to kind of give you a sense, and these are, by the way, very tame compared to considering what we typically see. The one in the upper left-hand corner is in Wakanda in Lake County. Um, the one in the, and, and that was on a school playground. The one in the upper middle um, was in a North Shore community. Um, this was a soccer club that decided that they would take their team picture with the Hail Hitler sign. The one on the right happened to be in Minneapolis. Um, it was at a public school in Minneapolis. Um, the one in the middle with the swastika and the Trump um, crossed off, that was in Lake Zurich. That got a lot of coverage for those of you who read the Daily Herald. Um, in the lower left-hand corner was the synagogue in Racine, um, so just over the Wisconsin border. So these are just really, you know, the unfortunate thing is we see these pretty much on a near daily basis. The other thing that we're seeing too that really is quite alarming is when we looked at our numbers from 2018 to 2019, we saw a 60% increase um, in school-based incidents in K through 12. 40% of all the incidents that we responded to were in schools and universities. And that compares to just 19% nationwide. So what it tells you is that younger kids and younger people are being exposed to this type of hate. And, I can, and I'll talk a little bit in a couple minutes about why I think that's the case. Um, but I wanted to just kind of put it out there here that we're not just talking about adults, we're talking about kids. And these are some other kind of key findings. Now, you saw a 56% increase in physical assaults, but the two that I really want to focus on is the second bullet that says 38% increase in incidents occurring in public places. So these aren't private incidents. These are ones where people want to make a statement, and they're being more brash, and they're being more bold, and they're being more public. And the other one I want to highlight is the one on the bottom. Only 13% are committed or inspired by extremist groups that we could track back to an extremist group. So these guys, these aren't necessarily card carrying members of the Klan or the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or the groups that you hear about um, in the news. These are people who are typically inspired online. Um, they're inspired to, to take some type of action, um, but you're not talking about groups and organizations, you're talking about individuals. And so that's really important. And the last piece too is these are, um, Dr. Yates talked a little bit about um, sort of far right extremism. These are white supremacist propaganda incidents. So we've seen, since 20, from between 2017 to 2019, a more than 500% increase in, in, in all um, white supremacist propaganda. And this is flyering, this is stickering, this is harassment, these are violent acts. But we also saw more than 100% increase on college campuses. And so that tells you also, again, um, who was being targeted by these types of groups because they view these students as being impressionable and they're ultimately trying to get it lower. And there are, other, there are groups like Identity Europa um, which is a far right, um, alt right uh, nationalist organization. And if you go on their website, they actually outline what their strategy is to go onto college campuses and force these types of conversations. Their playbook is right online on their website. And so somebody put in those questions, by the way, about you know these images. These aren't people who are wearing like you know clan uniforms. They're not people wearing black outfits and black combat boots, right? These are people wearing khakis and they're wearing polo shirts and they have nothing on their face because they want to show who they are. And so what we've seen is really almost like the professionalization of hate. These on-campus incidents, not only do you see propaganda, but on some, some college campuses, you actually have some of these, um, I would call them white, right-wing white nationalist organizations that are setting up tables in front of student unions. And if you walk up to them, they're wearing a polo shirt and they have a you know, nice little logo on there. And if you didn't know what that logo was, you'd be like, oh, it's just another student group. So I wanna transition here to talk a little bit about 21st century hate. Um, it used to be in, in, with ADL you know, a number of years ago when we tracked sort of online hate, you'd see it on, on, on these kind of extremist websites, 4chan or Gab or Telegram or parts of Reddit, which you may be familiar with, but now what we've really seen is I call it the mainstream of hate. You see it on Twitter, you see it on Facebook, you now see it on Instagram and YouTube and TikTok, these mainstream social media sites um, that have really taken on um, sort of this, this whole new level of hate. ADL on an annual basis does a survey um, on sort of what 
adults are experiencing online. And we found that more than half of Americans have experienced some form of hate or harassment. 37% of that hate was severe. Um, and you can see the sort of what it transit tran turned into. But we found that overwhelmingly people were harassed because of identity and politics. Um, and that occurs on a regular basis. We saw this earlier this year. These are some of the more tame cartoons that we saw. And none of these, by the way, I should point out, were taken off of far right extremist um, pages. They were taken off of Facebook and Twitter and others. And that's, you know, these, these were, you had xenophobia and anti-Semitism um, that was being targeted, um, blaming Jews and Asian Americans um, for the spread of, of the coronavirus. And then what you also saw is sort of the real world impact of what occurred online. Um, there, you saw no, there were a number of Asian Americans who were attacked in Naperville. In Evanston, you can see the graffiti. And then you saw the stay at home um, protests where Governor Pritzker was referred to, was um, compared to, to Hitler and, and the Nazis. And so you saw that. We also did um, a number of different um, studies through our Center for Technology and Society, which is based in Silicon Valley. We looked at um, uh, 30 days of Twitter um, back in August. And what we found is that Jewish lawmakers were being targeted because of their identity and being targeted uh, with anti-Semitism of ancient anti-Semitic tropes, dual loyalty um, charges uh, and others, con Jews controlling the government, and, you know, ancient anti-Semitic tropes. Um, but we saw a 70% increase. And then the one on the right, within what we did, we looked at um, Twitter, that within, a 12, within the 12 hour period after the president and the first lady announced they were positive for coronavirus, Chinese Americans faced an 85% increase. Um, in harassment online, just in the first 12 hours. Again, that sort of regurgitation and revitalization of the charge that Asian Americans were responsible for the spread of the coronavirus. Now, what I want to take here as a moment here is talk about now how this type of hate that we see online ultimately translates into sort of real life um, incidents. All of those images that you're seeing on the left-hand side were taken off of TikTok or um, um, uh, TikTok or um, uh, Instagram, now in Twitter also. Now, what you also have though, is that individuals who are going in and committing these violent acts are often being inspired online and they are turning to online. As Dr. Yates talked about Robert Bowers right there in that first quote, that was a, that was a post that he placed, that he, um, that he posted on a right-wing chat group. Highest happens to be a national Jewish organization that aids in immigrant and refugee resettlement. He said, I'm going in. The one on the bottom is a Facebook community organizing page that ultimately um, we saw that Kyle Rittenhouse, who was responsible for the murders in Kenosha, um, was being organized through. Um, and ultimately, so the point is like, when EDL looks at what we need to do through our center on extremism, we are working to actively track and catch these incidents before they go in because we found in all of those shootings that Dr. Yates talked about and others, that we have a window of between approximately 24 minutes and 16 hours during between the time when somebody posts something online and ultimately goes in. And that's the time period that we have found that we have to find these people to alert law enforcement so they can do what they need to do. The Michigan kidnapping that, you, that we all saw play out um, where Governor Whitmer was targeted, social media played an incredibly large role in helping recruit those who wanted to participate engage them, we found that the militia that was tied to the kidnapping, many of their pages had been taken down, taken down by Facebook already. Um, and then you just see kind of up there on the top of a post um, and the intensity of the post um, about, you know, opinion, threats against Governor Whitmer can't be tolerated. And someone says, oh, oh I disagree. What do you think the Second Amendment, Amendment was written? So this anonymity too that people realize online, um, they're able to get up there. I want to take this sort of last portion of my talk to talk a little bit about election related extremism because it's really immediate. This, this picture, by the way, was very famous. Um, this was Enrique Tarrio, who is the head of the Proud Boys. This was after President Trump refused to um, condemn white supremacy during the debate and said to the Proud Boys, stand by, stand, stand down, stand by. This was the head of the Proud Boys, who was a right wing um, uh, extremist group very violent one at that, saying we're standing down, but we're standing by. So 
we have seen, and these images that were taken, I want to kind of highlight it here. Is, and, and again, I don't want to become, I don't want this to turn into a partisan conversation, but these are most recent, and that's why I wanted to pull it. Those who are um, expressing concerns about the election, who have been participating in these Stop the Steal protests that occurred this past weekend, just yesterday, not all of them are extremists, not at all. But what these protests have created are environments in which those who might be sort of politically charged, supportive of President Trump, are intermingling with extremists. These extremists are using this as an opportunity to sort of take steps, take action. The pictures on the right were taken from the Washington DC rallies. Um, those are Proud Boys wearing their uniform. The one in the lower left-hand corner was taken from Portland. What is coming out of that individual on the left-hand side is pepper spray being sprayed um, at counter protesters. So, but these are Proud Boys who were participating yesterday in the rallies around the country. We also saw the Oath Keepers, which is another sort of militia-based right-wing group. Um, and the Oath Keepers here on the left-hand side was kind of their call to action um, uh, for yesterday's rally in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to highlight kind of two, two points here. One in particular, one is saying we all have to defend President Trump, but then on the bottom two of saying that the Oath Keepers are gonna keep people who are armed, who have uh, most experienced military combat veterans, they're gonna keep them just outside of Washington, DC, standing by awaiting the president's orders to call us up as a militia. Now that's not, you know, that whether that, whether that would ever happen, I don't know, but the fact of the matter is these individuals think that they have to take things into their own hands, which creates sort of potentially some violent, um, uh, ch the chance for violence is quite right. And then the last one here that I want to touch on is QAnon. Many of you have been, maybe have heard of QAnon. It has been deemed as a domestic ter terrorist threat by the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. It is a, um, uh, a movement that is based on conspiracy theories rooted in the idea that state governments are run by a cabal of pedophiles who ultimately President Trump was brought to root them out. And, and so when you have these situations where, um, you know, this uh, rally cry question everything, um, there are a number of elected officials, including a new member of Congress, who ran on QAnon conspiracy theory platforms that are ultimately driving questions about the election, that are driving questions about um, uh, um, a whole host of things. But, the, but it's not just the conspiracies that are dangerous, it's when they take things into, um, into their own hands. There have been a number of kidnappings, there have been killings that have been rooted to QAnon conspiracy theories. There was an attempt to, uh, to blow up the Hoover Dam um, rooted to conspiracy theories. Again, this is you know, kind of the world that we're, uh, we're, we're living in. So why this is occurring? Um, first and foremost, we are not only a polarized society, but we are a more confrontational society. The internet and social media, right? Long gone are those days where you gotta find a meeting in the darkness in the night. Somebody can pick up their phone right away and be exposed to hate symbols, hate speech in a matter of seconds, and kids are being exposed to it. The political and social environment, which we've covered, and basic ignorance of people not quite knowing exactly um, sort of what to believe, what not to, um, and, and the differences. So how you can take action. I'm going to spend these last two minutes talking about this, and then I'm going to wrap up. So the first is speaking out. When you see hate, you, you, got, you can't stay quiet. You got you to gotta speak out. You got to call it out where, when, it, when and where it occurs. Legislation, we have to make sure we've got the right laws on the books for hate crimes and hate speech. And lastly, on technology, social media has changed the way that we communicate with one another. Um, and ADL is the leader in the country um, trying to crack down and hold social media companies accountable. Um, when you have people like Steve Bannon calling for the public beheading, pu calling publicly for the beheading of, of government leaders, and that doesn't merit Facebook, pulling on down his account, that's a problem. And so, you know, we've got to crack down on, on and, and, and hold social media um, companies accountable. The next is educate yourself, trainings and webinars, reports and blogs, ADL is a hate symbols database online. I encourage you to take a look at a lot of these different things. Again, if you, and also if you see an incident, report it, report it to us, report it to law enforcement. It's really important um, that the appropriate people know how to respond. Lastly, on ADL's website, there are a whole host of um, lesson plans and book lists and how do you talk to kids about these types of issues, ranging from the election to extremism to mass shootings. 
how do you talk to kids about this? Um, because this is a really, really, really important thing um, to understand that we don't, no one's an expert on this. And that's why we work with schools um, to make, make their schools no place for hate um, and to prepare teachers on how to deal with these things. So lastly, you can follow us on social media, um, but I'm gonna wrap up. I think I went a little bit longer than I said I was going to, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm gonna wrap up and turn it over uh, um, to Rabbi Frisch Klein and Councilwoman Powell. So thanks so much. Thank you, thank you very much, David. So um, now we're gonna get uh, local community perspectives from uh, two of the communities that, um, as we saw from the data, are uh, like most highly impacted by this type of uh, extremist violence, and that's the Jewish community and the Black community. I asked uh, Margaret and, and Tish who would like to go first. Both deferred to the other, so I flipped a coin, and Tish won. So you're on, Tish. Great. So what does that mean? We, I don't know which is winning in that case. <laughs> well, thank you for having me today. And wow, this is, this is just very deeply personal for me as a leader in our community, but as a Black woman in America, um, just watching everything that has unfolded in our country, um, just recently and then over the course of history. And um, I'm a native from Michigan. So um, some of the things that have been brought up, um, David, I'm not sure if you're, um, if, if you're a U of M fan or, or a Spartan I'm a, I'm a Spartan, fan. but I'm from just outside of Detroit. So I've got both in my family. I shout out to my cousins that are online that are U of M alums, Justin and Jennifer um, and their parents, my aunt and uncle are Michigan State fan, so I have to root for both. Considering you're really a Notre Dame fan. Uh, yes, I'm a Notre Dame alum, so um, that trumps everything right now. Um, but I, one of the reasons I wanted to bring up Michigan is Dr. Yates mentioned in, in her overview um, over the, you know, about the history of hate and, and extremism, um, about how a lot of it, um, was started in the Midwest and the growth in the Midwest, um, because I think a lot of people just automatically uh, think about the Klan and think about the South and racism in the South. And, and, and it's not just a Southern thing. Um, this is something that has deep roots in history um, in the North and specifically in the Midwest. And um, we, we saw that most recently happen um, in Michigan with the um, planned kidnapping of um, Governor Whitmer, Whitner in Michigan, um, that was deeply troubling on, on so many different levels. And so um, I really appreciate Dr. Yates bringing that up. Um, and David brought up a lot of good points as well um, in, in terms of, you know, the fact that it's not just these hate groups, it's, you know, a lot of individuals and the, the number of young people that are not only um, being targeted apart as, as this hate has, has manifested itself in our communities, but young people being involved in uh, these, these hate crimes. Uh, most recently, um, one that really sticks with me is uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, um, who um, uh, was involved with the, uh, with the shooting of, of two people in, uh, in Wisconsin uh, most recently. Um, very young, and there was over a million dollars raised for this man, um, you know, online. Um, so I just, I, I, all of this is just very, very sombering for me. Um, but it's nothing new for Black people. Um, I know a lot of people say, wow, where did all this hate come from? And this is just so new for, for, for so many people. It, I just will tell you, it's not new for Black people. This is not new. It has just manifested itself very differently um, in the United States most recently. Um, the Klansmen have openly taken their hoods off and are operating in plain sight. Uh, some of them are running for office and are, are, are being um, elected to public office. Um, and they're not ashamed. You know, I've, one of my favorite um, signs I've, I've seen over the past couple of years is you know, not make America great again, it's make racists afraid again. Um, they are not afraid anymore and they are operating in plain sight. 
um, in, in our country. And it is very, very um, disturbing. But one thing I, I, I wanted to touch base on a little bit is when we, when we look at who is perpetrating these hate crimes and when they are apprehended and um, how they're treated, I, I, I love to, to point out the fact that um, Dylan Roof was um, calmly um, and, and without incident apprehended by, by the police in South Carolina and was even taken to Burger King before they took him to jail, um, which very just flies in the face of, of every black person in America after he killed nine people, nine black people worshiping in church service. Um, we're often a lot of times, you know, killed for much less um, uh, by the by police in America. This man was taken to Burger King and gets an opportunity to stand trial. So I also, you know, I say that to, to just bring up the whole, um, the, the white privilege that these terrorists operate under, um, even, even when they're apprehended. Um, they're, they're taken alive, they're allowed to go to trial and face a jury of their peers. Um, and, and, and most commonly, you know, black people are not given that opportunity. Um, I looked at some, some local um, statistics from the state of Illinois in, in regards to help um, hate crimes. Um, statistics in Illinois in 2019, the, the vast majority, um, the, the largest percentage of, of, of hate crimes were anti-Black and uh, closely followed by anti-gay um, anti-LGBTQ crimes um, in our state. Um, so again, it, it's not just um, a, a, in terms of race, it is, it's religion, it's LGBTQ, it's an, very anti-immigrant. Um, we've seen some of that locally in our own community. One that comes to mind very vividly is I want to say around 2010, 2009, in our own community, there was a group called um, AFLA, and AFLA, um, the 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 uh, group stood for Americans for Legal Americans, and it was a, a very anti-immigrant group, in in our uh, that operated not only just in Elgin, but um, there there was a lot of anti-immigrant um, ideology. Um, across the region and and obviously that that still is something that's taking place so um i, I just want to bring that up as well because that is a, a an issue um that we've seen here locally in our own community and i'll, I'll pass it on to um uh, rabbi fritch klein to uh say a couple words by my, my local partner in crime and a lot of this i really appreciate your your leadership margaret well, and I always appreciate yours and in the leadership of the Gail Borden Public Library and Janaid, who worked at the tar Targeted Violence Prevention Program for the state of Illinois. Um, and, and all of that is a very good thing. But what um, Tish and I, I, maybe I should be more formal, Councilwoman Tish and I were supposed to do is to provide some local color commentary. I use the word color guardedly in that sentence. Um, so I want to go back a little ways, um, and some of it, um, this is a remarkable panel you've put together, Tish Kalimer, because apparently four of us have strong Michigan roots, um, and I'm not alone in that. So I want to go back to 1987 to Dr. Yates's point. I took a class as a young um, Jewish educator called Facing History in Ourselves, which is about um, looking at the Holocaust through, um, amongst other things, bystander behavior um, lens, and um, discovered to my, um, you know, black and white clips of some of those hate groups and the fact that the hate groups have grown um, exponentially since 1987. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center, which hasn't been mentioned yet today, runs a hate map. And in 2018, the last time I did this presentation, they had documented 917 hate groups in the United States. When I went online to prepare for this 
um, earlier in the week, they are up to 940 hate groups in the United States. There are 28 or 33 hate groups in Illinois, um, one of which is a KKK branch in Gurney. Um, but here in Elgin, for the most part, I think because of partnerships with the library and things like Not In Our Town and, and um, frankly, um, the Coalition of Elgin Religious Leaders and the, the Human Relations Commission and some other things, we've been rather fortunate. Although I will tell you that there isn't a kid in our Hebrew school grades four through up, we don't really do this in a lower grade level, um, that hasn't had at least some anti-Semitic joke or bullying. They all tell the stories. This is current. I asked again this morning. Um, and, and so perhaps that kind of anti-Semitic teasing, bullying, joking is what leads to this kind of violent extremism that we're talking about today. David did a great job on showing the slides on, on rising anti-Semitism. Um, the question becomes, how does that impact us here in Elgin? And I will tell you that um, through the, the very diligent work of our lay leadership board, we were able to receive um, now two grants from the Homeland Security Department to harden our target. Um, some of that, um, we're not gonna tell you how we've hardened the target because that would make us more vulnerable. I will tell you that um, sometimes the rabbi has sleepless nights um, because uh, particularly last Hanukkah after the stabbing of a rabbi in his own home at the Hanukkah party, at his own Hanukkah party, which by the way, some of you have even been to my Hanukkah parties, right? Um, I'm the visible sign of Judaism in Elgin and I move around a lot. And sometimes I even have coffee with somebody like Tish or with Tracy Ellis. And then, you know, there are two of us that are targets sitting there. Um, it was quite um, touching when, I think it was AJC, um, did this proud and Jewish campaign after the stabbing last year. And I went around town and I held up my little sign at the, at the um, city hall and then at the police department. I'm a police chaplain, so I double dip sometimes. Um, and um, Janaid came over to the house and we, there's a picture of us standing together with that sign. Um, but these are very real things. So I wanna, I'm gonna share my screen now. I think this will work. Um, I have two slides, just two slides, I think. Um, that's the second slide. In 2016, um, there was a flag that showed up at the Kane County Fairgrounds. Can you all see the screen? Yes, so this is a very local thing. Um, it was at the flea market. It was a Nazi flag in a booth that was being sold as war memorabilia. It hit national news. We managed to get the flag taken down in about six hours. That was a concerted effort of a number of people, Zion Lutheran Church, President St. Joseph Hospital and, and um, Ed Hunter, who's a chaplain, Second Baptist, the Black Baptist Church, just for context, uh, the Church of the Brethren, St. James Episcopal Church and others the police of Elgin and elected officials. And then I had to march in the 4th of July parade the next day. Um, when we dug, when the pastor from the St. James Episcopal Church and I sat on my couch and we dug down and I tried to do this again in preparation for this and most of it has been, um, dare I say, whitewashed. Yes, they were marketing it as war memorabilia but if you go back and find the original stuff on this vendor, you will find that he was a member of one of the, the extremist groups. And to somebody's point in chat, he was so misogynistic, I didn't even know what to do. So you can call it, by the way, the other side of the booth was a Confederate flag. And there are Confederate flags, if anybody wants to take the driving trip with me, that still fly in South Elgin. We used to joke that when I moved to South Elgin, I didn't know that I had moved below the Mason-Dixon line. Um, so 
that was 2016 before the election. But I believe there's a pretty good coalition here in Elgin that works on these issues. Now I wanna show you the night before the election to the, to the Michigan piece. And the ADL was very outspoken about this. This is the Jewish cemetery in Grand Rapids. There are actually two Jewish cemeteries in Grand Rapids. It's not clear that this was anti-Semitic violence. It is clear that it's racism, it, that it's um, vandalism. What you can't see is the rest of it says Trump and it says MAGA. My parents are buried in the other cemetery in Grand Rapids. Trump actually spoke in Grand Rapids that night. The cemetery has been cleaned up. It's, you can't actually say that it's right wing extremism, but, it's, but it definitely has made it into the mainstream. So I found this and it hit my newsfeed in about 12 minutes after it hit the ADLs because everybody wanted to know. The first one was, are your parents okay? And I'm thinking, well, they haven't been for over 10 years, they're dead. Um, and then it became clear what this was about. Um, so I just wanted to show those two pictures because they're, they're striking. Um, and there've been very little direct things about here in Elgin. I will say that at one point, the Google reviews of CKI, there was, and this was somebody in Oklahoma because, you know, like to the North, to the New Zealand thing, this isn't just um, very local, it's broader. Somebody with too much time on his hands sitting in Oklahoma City decided to put bad reviews of CKI, uh, which is Congregation Knesset Israel abbreviated to CKI, um, the McHenry County Jewish um, Congregation. And for some reason, the Elk Grove Village Police Department. And they were all anti-Semitic. And there is a form for taking that down on Google but they don't work very quickly. So luckily one of the best interns I ever had in my previous life as a marketing consultant for high tech companies is now at Google and the Google Israeli employees managed to get it taken down. But we did file a police report. We did file something with ADL and you know Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, it was ugly. Um, the one at MCJC was even uglier because uh, it targeted the rabbi in particular. Um, so it happens, but we, we, we haven't seen a lot here, but it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. So I think that's what I had. And, and just to piggyback on what she said in terms of you know, what has happened here, and this is according to our, our police department, that overall the past few years, we've had very few incidents that are actually um, can be labeled as a, as a hate crime, probably less than 10. But you know, again, as a leader in the community, I want Elgin to be a community where everyone feels welcome and everyone feels safe. So even 10 is, is disturbing. Um, and, and according to the police department, uh, the majority of those seem to be more specific to a person versus a group. Um, but that could also be perspective, you know, it's, it, that's all in the eye of the beholder as well. Um, so, you know, as, as we keep a careful watch over what's happening nationally, what's happening across our state, um, you know, we have to be mindful about our own community and what happens in our own community as well, um, because that's, um, that's very real to all of us. Um, okay. And part, this is possible that this is a place where Tish and I may not agree. Um, I'm hanging in there as a police chaplain, partly because I think that's a way to keep some of the anti-Semitism at bay and so that my, peop my people can have better police coverage. 
So um, just a couple of the things that we all have done together, those not in our town things with the Gail Borden Public Library. Um, I love the sign that hangs in the in City Hall about diversity in HR, which sometimes I make Gail Cohen pull if I'm doing a rally or a vigil or whatever. Um, the rally that we all did after Charlottesville, standing on City Hall Plaza, and then after Pittsburgh, um, the church across the street from us, Holy Trinity, and I did what we called, I, more than I, right? Unity on Division Street. So when there's something, we know we have people that will stand up and be counted. The question is always, how do we prevent that from happening? And I think partly it's from doing panels like this. Absolutely. So I'm not seeing where we don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's mean, fabulous. I mentioned we wouldn't be on the same page, Margaret. I'm, I'm missing. <laughs> someday, someday this pandemic will over, be over and we can have wine again. It'll be much more fun. Um, yes, but there are so many local organizations that I really um, appreciate their work. The library, our Human Relations Commission, um, and and. Elgin in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Um, there are just so many different groups that have really been actively involved in the in, in having the conversations that need to be had in our community and bringing people together. And um, one of the things I'm most proud of, um, all of the different Black Lives Matter protests that we had here recently after the murder of George Floyd we didn't have any violence in our community. And I think people were expecting certain things to happen just based on what they were seeing in other parts of our country. We wound up with beautiful artwork downtown. Yes, and there's gonna be more of that. We're gonna be preserving that in a way, so. The question also was, how does it move from extreme to mainstream? And so, um, I. I, I didn't do a whole power. This is my PowerPoint. It's just a little story. <laughs> um, at one point, Tish, you probably remember this. I was called into a U46 school board meeting because they were going to talk about um, African American History Month. You, you may have been there. I was speaker three. And um, one of the things that was so shocking to me was the amount of misinformation that got read into the U46 school board minutes by people who would say things that, that are just categorically untrue. But the whole, the whole question of you know, what you teach kids, how you select textbooks, who you vote for, all of this becomes, you know, I have high school friends in Michigan that are still in Michigan, in Grand Rapids, that are huge QAnon people. And I'm like, how did this happen? Right? I don't quite get that. But those are really important questions, the how you choose textbooks. Which I don't think we have a problem at U46, but that's a national problem. It is so, a national problem. I, and I, would, I think I would just sort of offer to that point, uh, you know, one of the things that um, we, we know exists, and some of you may have heard this term, there's a thing called algorithmic biases. So the way that algorithms work, when you search for things online, when you look at things or click on things on Facebook or on Twitter or whatnot, is you're creating essentially a profile for yourself. You're opting in and you're indicating what you're most interested in. And so an algorithm that gets built on your Google searches, an algorithm that gets built on your actually your Gmail and your Yahoo emails and what you're receiving, algorithms that are based on what pages you follow and people you follow on Twitter and Facebook and what you click on ultimately drives content to you that the algorithm thinks you're most interested in. We've all done a search at some point for, you know, a, a, a new radio or a new TV or a new kitchen appliance or going on a vacation somewhere to Marriott and staying in a Marriott or whatever. And all of a sudden, every advertisement on every website you go to starts popping up. And even though you're like, I bought that pot six weeks ago, but I'm still getting advertisements for it. 
Those are called algorithmic biases. And so where this really comes into play, and I think it's important to understand is that it's becoming increasingly more and more difficult to be exposed to views that you are not already sort of inclined to have. So that doesn't explain QAnon. That's a that, but it but that that's a whole uh, you know issue unto itself. But when you start talking about young people and you start talking about educating them and exposing them to different things, and you get back to sort of the ignorance that exists, we have to recognize that we as individuals, frankly, I mean, there's news stations for whatever your political inclination may be, you choose to watch a certain station a certain network because you th you stop listening to radio stations or, or TV stations, right? You're exposed to the things that you already think you believe in. So when we start talking about biases and we start talking about sort of um, dealing with racism and anti-Semitism and xenophobia and misogyny and anti-LGBTQ um, perspectives, like we've got to address sort of how people are getting their information. Um, it, it, it becomes really important. And I know this was a little bit of a tangent off of what you were saying, Rabbi, but, but the point of sort of from an educational perspective and what we're exposed to, I think we have to recognize that that, that is what we're constantly dealing with. I want to ask a question to the panel. It's related to this, you know, um, you, we've talked about uh, exposing uh, young people in particular, but everybody in general to, um, you know, the positive images and things like that. But um, what about, uh, you know, like teaching young people, particularly, I'm talking about students um, in our schools about, you know, what anti-Semitism is, what anti-LGBTQ bias is, what, uh, you know, uh, anti-Black racism is, um, actually talking about the negative things at an early age so that they are less inclined um, to buy into the false narratives and the tropes that are presented to them later in life, sort of like inoculating them against these narratives, you know, that, 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 that get introduced later. I'm happy to start at least from an ADL education perspective. So with our younger, first of all, I, I couldn't agree more, but you know, from a, from a younger student perspective, typically like third grade and younger, um, we don't go into these issues of racism and religion and, and maybe we should, right? Maybe we should expose people much earlier, but what we really work on them as being, is what it means to be an ally, what it means to be an upstander and not a bystander, right? So it's, a be, it's, it's more behavioral than it is necessarily, you know, you're acting a particular way or somebody's acting a particular way because of someone's race or religion or, or, or gender or whatnot. But instead we talk about, if you see bullying on a playground, do you, do you join in? Do you say nothing or you do something about it, right? And doing something, by the way, could be telling a teacher, right? But we try to instill confidence in them to sort of know what to do in those situations. And from there, use that as a foundational sort of belief or, um, I don't know, I'm not, an edu I'm not a professional educator, but the, a found it's foundational, right? And as we get older, that's when we actually do start educating them. And what we try to do, frankly, is work with schools. We do it through a couple different programs. We do it one through something called our No Place for Hate program. And this is something perhaps we should talk about the district. Um, and it, what it really is, is it's a year round program about building a culture where, and it's student driven, right? So schools, put together um, student-driven um, committees that identify from a list of about 40 different activities that they could do during the course of the year. And they have to do at least three of them during the course of the year that are all driven about, uh, about um, how to be an upstander, not a bystander, how to, but then also digging into um, some issues a little bit deeper. And that's a year round culture change. And the goal behind that is to create the right culture. And then the second part that we do is through what we call our World of Difference Institute. And this is an anti-bias training program. We do it for students. So we do kind of like peer to peer, but then we also do it for faculty and, and teachers and administrators, because we find, you know, you don't learn when you're in college becoming, getting your teaching degree and how to deal with when you walk into the room, a swastika or the N word being written on the board. 
teachers often want to do the right things, but they don't know how to, they don't know what to do and they fear that they're gonna do the wrong thing. And so there's an element of training them so that they can actually handle it so that it gets embedded in the professional culture of the school district. And ultimately, um, sometimes they, sometimes those trainings occur because the school's responding to an incident. But then ultimately what we try to do is get them to build it into their professional development program too, long term, whether it be with us or anybody else, but just say it's important and make it part of who you are as a school district. Can I add something to some of that? Um, I think that all, I've, I've always been really interested in hearing about how some of the advocacy groups like ADN and SPL, SPLC do that kind of work, especially with young students, because, you know, I, I'm an educator also, so I get college students occasionally, I'm primarily a researcher, but I also teach college students, and by the time they get there, they, you know, they, they do know something, they're becoming adults, um, and one of the things that I found in teaching at this level is that, so I've taught in sociology and in terrorism studies, and um, what I found is that, I'll just say this briefly, if you're going to talk to, you know, white students about racism and anti-Semitism and homophobia and prejudice and bias and all these things, you also have to talk not just about the phobias and the isms and the prejudice and the bias, but you have to talk about whiteness also. And you have to talk about, you know, getting them to think of themselves and, and to recognize that. Um, and so that's something I always talk to them about. And the other is, is really to try to establish early on that, uh, they might feel defensive a lot and to try to get them comfortable with that feeling and to address it. Um, because that's not something I think that they're used to. They're, they, are, they should be getting used to expressing themselves and you know, thinking for themselves. That's a really important part of what we do. Um, and you know, so I try to think of ways and moments when I've been taught something or made something has become clear to me you know, and try to, to get uh, especially white students you know, um, comfortable with that, that level, that, that emotion that they have and to try to deal with it. Um, so those are just some things that I, you know, end up dealing with probably on a weekly basis when I'm teaching, so. Thank you, thank you both. Um, we've got, a, uh, it seems like we have a lot of questions. So uh, I'm gonna move to another topic. And um, that is something that I think maybe one of the panelists touched on, and it's the recruitment of, um, you know, uh, far right extremism in the military and uh, and and in the police departments. Um, so, if uh, is that is that a problem? And um, you know, uh, what if anything is being done about it? And and if you know, what more should we be doing to address it? Um, and I know David said that. Uh, uh, he, he would be able to speak to that and would love to hear the other panelists after David uh, weigh in on this issue as well. No problem, I'll be brief. But there, we've seen um, an increase in sort of in, in, in a presence of these different groups, extremists in law enforcement um, and in the military. Um, it's not to a point where, um, you know, they're taking over departments or anything like that. But what we are seeing, though, is that there is a presence and what we what we work with law enforcement is that they have, you know, it, I'll use one example because it made um, news in the region um, following the protests um, in downtown Chicago around uh, after the, the murder of George Floyd. Um, it was exposed that there was a Chicago police officer who was wearing a three percenter um, bandana across his um, face. Now, we didn't see it. Actually, a CBS producer who we had just done a story with recognized the logo. But there were white shirts, meaning there were sergeants around and supervisors who were around who were not telling this individual to take it off or holding this person accountable. And the three percenters are um, an alt-right group who believe that um, only three percenters of the colonists, three percent of the colonists were the ones who ultimately secured freedom from the British. And then they are the three percent of the United States who will fight against tyranny and save us all from it. Um, and so they had a, a significant presence at the stay-at-home protests in Springfield and in downtown Chicago. Their banners were up behind the speakers. Um, and so I use it as a, for example, is that I think that hate, hate groups and hate symbols and these organizations pop up so fast. And with the internet, they establish themselves, they create new logos and whatnot. And so I think it's really incumbent upon law enforcement, number one, to be up to speed on sort of what's going on. And it, truth be told, in some of the larger departments, they struggle with it. So when you start getting with the smaller ones, it's a lot more difficult. One of the things that has popped up a lot with law enforcement has been the view um, of QAnon in LaSalle, 
Um, there were a couple officers who showed up at um, those stay-at-home protests wearing um, QAnon um, t-shirts and, and sweatshirts. And so the question then became is that, is that okay for law enforcement? They're, they're on their own, right? Shouldn't they be allowed to have their own views? Or emerging from the chaos oh, last night. Walk us through, please, what happened here? I was looking for something. Oh, no problem. So, so, I, so I think that like when that, when that, when those occur, certainly we believe that somebody is permitted to have whatever views he or she has, but it begs the question of if someone is, if a, if a police officer um, believes in QAnon conspiracy theories or ascribes to certain views, how does that impact when they pull somebody over, right? How does it impact how they deal with communities, right? If you are ascribing to certain views, how, how is that going to play out? And so we think it's incumbent upon law enforcement to not only do that background check when, when someone's going through the academy, but they need to be better up to speed on, on where departments are uh, and where their officers are, um, because it, it affects it in lots of different ways. And, and one last piece by Jay, we should be clear though, a lot of these sort of alt-right, white supremacist, white nationalist groups, they are actively trying to recruit law enforcement. They are actively trying to uh, recruit military, not only because they believe that it improves their sort of, um, uh, their militarized abilities, shall we say, or ability, ability to militarize, but even more though, if they believe that the the state, the deep, you know, there, there's a, a, a deep infiltration of the state that, you know, that is this cabal of pedophiles or other types of conspiracies, their feeling is the way they can get in and infiltrate it and, and stop it also is by having people in those places. Thanks, David. Uh, Dr. Yates, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, and sure, and, and you can all call me Liz. Um, I, I appreciate it, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to go by Liz. But um, yeah, so I think there's a couple things there, and I think he covered a lot of the most recent, you know, things we've all seen that have been incredibly concerning. Um, one one concern that I have uh, as someone who watches this is that this is definitely happening. You know, we we do track uh, military experience in um, in our looking at our radicalization pathways database, and it's I think it's you know it's it's a it's a good percentage. Um, of far right extremists who have military experience, and one thing we worry about is, is as we are certainly encouraging law enforcement agencies and military agencies to um, be cognizant, be aware, and be up to date of this kind of activity within their ranks. Um, but you know, what do you do afterwards? After you identify someone, and if you just kick them out, okay, where is that person going to be in terms of their radicalization and their activity? It could be a dangerous situation where you have people who are, um, have a lot of training and capacity and as well as, you know, network connections to extremist groups or whatever. And so we want to make sure that as part of this process, and as, you know, it should be a very deliberate process to be addressing this, that they're thinking about what comes next, right? So it's once it's no longer their problem, right? But who else it's a problem for everyone else. So I think uh, incorporating that into the strategy is really important. And the other thing, uh, there have been so many really good questions here. I was getting a little overwhelmed trying to respond to them all here, but um, someone had a question about the sort of historical long-term relationship between state-sponsored racist violence uh, from the military, the police, and, and you know, white supremacist uh, organized civilian violence. And I think that that um, I think that where how we should understand that is in terms of white supremacists starting to see they in different points in history have seen the police is on their side and then get very nervous once they think that law enforcement is not on their side. And so historically, you can see this happened very clearly in the 60s and 70s when all of a sudden, um, you know, the state changed the laws to become more uh, racial, uh, equitable in terms of race, especially. And that was a moment when you saw white supremacists turn from sort of defining themselves as pro-state to anti-state. And so Kathleen Ballou, who's a historian, calls this the revolutionary turn, right? Then all of a sudden you see them rather than being like, okay, we're here for the founding fathers, you know, then they're suddenly like, we need to overturn the government, right? And so you see some of those dynamics play out uh, today in some of the relationships between militia groups or white supremacist groups and law enforcement, whereas in some cases they're trying actively to build relationships with them to, you know, 
see themselves as one of them. I can think of an example in, in my home state of Washington state where a guy got arrested, uh, a neo-Nazi, and he would, you know, said to the cops, don't worry, like, I'm with you, you know, and they were like, these cops were like, you know, um, not happy to hear that. So uh, certainly that happens, but you also have seen, especially in some of the, some elements of the Boogaloo Boys, an anti-government, anti-law enforcement um, approach. So you do see it happen in different ways, and it's really important to try to understand all of the different potential relationships that might exist that way. So those are just, I hope I'm answering some of the questions as we go, but i um, happy to talk about that more too. Thank you. Tish and, and Margaret, do you guys have any um, thing you want to share on, on this issue of, uh, you know, um, white supremacists trying to recruit in the military and police forces experiences, anything like that? All right, so I want to move to another question. Um, uh, it was something uh, related to data. Um, I think, Liz, you might be able to help with this one. Um, the uh, the START Center, is it tracking um, hate crimes or violence or, uh, you know, um, the, you know, acts of domestic terrorism against the Latino community in the United States? Uh, yeah, so uh, let me let me say a few things about hate crime data. It is it is lacking across the country. We just uh, it is very difficult. I'm I'm sure David can talk a lot about this too. A lot of hate crimes go unreported to law enforcement. Uh, we know from victim uh, victimization surveys that's a very low percentage. Obviously, a lot of the communities that are targeted, you know, might not have good relationships with law enforcement or with institutional actors, and might not be comfortable reporting, or you know, honestly, figure nothing's going to happen, that kind of thing. So, you know, anyone that has data on this is we have to think of it as you know representative on some level or or a, a fraction of, of what's really occurring. Um, the FBI uh, does collect hate crimes data, um, but it, they're mandated to do so, but jurisdictions report to them, and lots of the times jurisdictions don't actually report the data, right, or they don't, they collect it in different ways. So um, we do, uh, we actually recently created, I think we just released some of the data from this, um, this last week and the week before, we created what we think is a representative uh, analysis of hate crime offenders. Um, so it is not comprehensive of every attack that's occurred. That's just way out of the scope of our ability to do, frankly, of anyone to do. We, we use, you know, open source data collection. We rely on the research from groups like ADL or other types of advocacy groups, but especially on court documents and on um, media reports. So no one has great data on that. Um, that being said, um, we do have some data to suggest that it's grown. Um, we don't, you know, the, the numbers aren't super clear, but I think uh, attacks against Latinx members or, you know, Latino community has definitely increased. There's some research to suggest that it's increased at particular moments when there are political, uh, contentious political moments when, you know, sort of some of the um, more restrictive uh, policies like in Arizona, SB 1070, I believe, and then like 2002, that kind of thing, that those kinds of political actions might spur that that target immigrants might spur further violence or hate crimes against immigrants. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a perfect answer for you on that. Um, frankly, understanding better also, I think your question was how it's affecting the Latino community. Understanding the impact on targeted communities is something probably that, that data doesn't, we haven't done enough research on generally. And I think we should spend more time on that. Um, one other thing I'll say about hate crimes is um, and this gets to also some of the something that Tish brought up and that other people have commented on is the the difference in the treatment between hate crime offenders and Islamist extremists or other you know typical uh, people who uh, are you know interact with law enforcement, and that's something that you know we think a, a lot about too. Um, and that's one reason why uh, we have our, our director has recently argued that when we talk about terrorism, we should always also talk about hate crime because. Whether or not you call it terrorism or whether you call it hate crime can sometimes be a product of what the legislation is, right? There's much, and I won't get into all that, but there's different legislative statutes and things that treat that that result in the treatment of these populations differently. Um, and then there's all sorts of cultural and social reasons, right? So that by talking about hate crime in the same, you know, sort of normative way as terrorism can really, we hope to to address some of those distinctions. Um, and that's happening to some extent, I think. Increasingly, but 
you know, we have a long way to go. Um, so that's just one dimension of that, that uh, problem you talked about. Thanks, Liz. I appreciate that insight. Uh, Margaret? So one of the things that I was aware of after the 2016 election, I was at, on the, um, I don't even know what we call it anymore, but the, the clergy advisory board to the U46 school administration. And we were having lunch in November out at a church that's not really in Elgin. Um, and one of the administrators was explaining that, that they were already beginning to see the hate ratchet up. Now, this is not a hate crime. These are kids, but they were building a wall out of backpacks and telling the Latino kids that they should go home to their country because they were going to be deported. Oh, well, I, I, we had that, so we had we, that in our home. So when you talk about kids, I, I'm not shocked by this actually, but when you talk about how it enters the mainstream, that's a piece of how it enters the mainstream. We were already seeing it in the first two weeks after the election, before the inauguration, where other kids were picking on the Latinx kids in elementary school. Well, it was before he won. My kids came home in 2016 and asked if we would have to leave the country because uh, their classmates said, uh, when Trump wins, all the Muslims have to leave. So um, <laughs> it didn't take the winning of the election, it just it took him being nominated. Um, but again, we're not, you know, uh, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, uh, he, he created that kind of culture um, and the community has responded and uh, it is what it is. Um, sorry, I digress by making it personal. Um, but uh, I wanted to um, also uh, try to take this conversation a little bit towards what can we do? We talked about it a little bit, um, but I think uh, we, we got a question even before the panel started yesterday. And um, the, the, the person who you know, wrote to us said, you know, what can be done to people in this segment, meaning the far right extremist movements, um, to bring them into the center? He, he called it the center. Um, how can we address their concerns and still make progress to improve our country? And um, I want to first take this to Liz, because I, I understand that you're doing some research on reintegrating, um, you know, uh, formers. Uh, and I think that your research might be very helpful to, you know, understanding how we can get, you know, beyond this, you know, uh, situation where we have uh, extremists engaging in violence. What, what does it take and what are you finding in your research? Yeah, so um, I mean, it's, 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 it's a lot to think about. I will say that, so the research that we've done really looks at, you know, violent, mostly violent, but criminal extremists. You know, these are typically people um, who have had sort of long careers in extremism. These are not people who, you know, are just sort of living their lives and sometimes expressing anti-Semitic or racist, you know, sentiment or something. These are people whose lives Typically, that's that's the the focus of of the the project I've been involved in, you know, um, have gone to prison potentially, or their lives have been defined by this to some level. So that's a particular you know population of people that might be the targets of this kind of work, right? So I just want to clarify that uh, those parameters. Um, but what we found is that in some ways, one is that there's a there's a big difference between de-radicalization and disengagement. So de-radicalization is this idea I think that people have that there's a cognitive transformation and that people who you know once were super racist will become you know leaders in advocating for diversity and everything and i'm seeing a face here right that does not always happen right like one of the goals is first to get people to start advocating for racism and violence and to stop organizing because some of these individuals especially the ones that are formers now who are going around speaking you know they played huge roles in organizing these movements um and so you really have to disentangle those two kinds of processes, um, but they are related, right? Like you'll, you'll see that people, uh, you know, once they sort of get themselves removed from these networks, just, you know, they realize, wow, I was just sort of brainwashed by this, or I was just consumed by this. It was something it was a part of my identity and a part of my life. And so by, they are related processes. 
Um, but we found that there were kind of two different populations um, among far right extremists specifically that had different pathways out. And one were these sort of more typical criminals who had, you know, long criminal histories. They may have been involved in especially like white prison gangs that, you know, were animated by white supremacist ideologies, but also were just sort of engaging in typical drug dealing and other kind of more typical criminal behavior. Um, and they needed help with the basics, like finding a job, finding economic stability, finding friends who weren't racist, that kind of thing, especially. And then there was another group of people who were really involved um, for their sort of identity, right? And so they were people who maybe hadn't, hadn't gone to prison, but had been involved in creating content and propaganda and were seen as leaders in this. And so got so much of their identity out of that. And they really needed for that to be replaced with something else, right? So, you know, these people join these movements because they're looking for something. That's sort of a finding about terrorism in general, right? Is that people on some level, it might not be a selfish act, right? They, if you really believe it, and not everyone does who's in these, right? Not everyone is an ideologue here, but you're looking for um, some, some purpose in life. And so if you can, you know, redirect some of that and help move people towards seeing other ways um, and to replace that activity that, that you can uh, remove them from, from some of those most harmful activities and organizing that way. Again, this is with really committed people coming from these movements really directly. That's not to say that we should be approaching, you know, the more common sort of just mainstream attitudes that are very harmful the same way. Um, but, you know, we do, we do have to, there are not program, you know, they're not like national programs in the US to deal with this right now. Um, and again, you know, just like we've said with some of the problems with law enforcement in the military, you know, when people are coming out of prison and going on probation or going into new communities, you know, it's not always evident to uh, the people in their communities that they have this background or what to do about it. And so educating more and more professionals and social service providers and all of that about what extremism here looks like uh, what their ideas are, um, you know, that that's going to make a difference because it's, it's not something that's going anywhere. So, yeah. Anybody else have any um, thoughts on, uh, you know, um, that, that, that area? I'm happy to offer a couple. I just, and they're less specific, a little bit more rhetorical, but I'll offer this as I think that these are marginalized views, right? These are these are views that are um, that have historically been on the margins and have found sort of new life in, frankly, recent years. Um, and I think that what we as a society have to do, in many ways, you know, beyond what Dr. Yates was talking about, sort of dealing with the individuals, is I think that we have to push these this these idea ideologies. And these views of the world, frankly, back to the fringes where they belong. Um, and you're talking about sort of what hit, what you know what is what is acceptable in the public realm, what's acceptable in the public discourse. How do we hold our elected officials um, accountable, and frankly, ensure that they're insightful with an S and not insightful with a C? Um, and I think that that's really important. So um, we have to hold people to a higher standard, I think, um, and, and, and respond to falsehoods and misinformation with facts. And it's going to, frankly, take time to overcome sort of, frankly, the mess that we're in right now, to be honest. Um, and, and, and I think it's going to take time and reason. And, and we're, we've got to work with kids, too, um, to, to address those issues. Margaret, did you have something? I was thinking about what David just said and um, what he said previously about sort of what I would call an echo chamber, that if you only talk to people who think exactly like you do, or you only watch the news channel that promotes what you already think you believe, then you, you don't have the full perspective, right? It's hard, I was a former journalist, so, um, the whole question of what is truth becomes a really interesting question. And then because I started, Al Bender asked a question in the chat a while ago about Al, and you probably can't unmute, can you? Al Bender, do you think on a federal level, the new administration will have a different impact on the hate prevention and dissemination of hate information? 
It's a really good question, but based on what David just said, I think it's gonna take a long, long time because people are still so tied to those echo chambers. That would be the first part of my answer, but Al's heard from me before. So does somebody else wanna take that one on? Well, I, I, I wanna um, comment that, uh, uh, you know, that, that particular angle, like uh, in terms of how to push back those fringe ideas to where they belong um, is, is going to be tied more to like what we as communities are, are willing to do, because at the end of the day, the government is hamstrung um, by the First Amendment in terms of what it can do to marginalize those ideas and put them in, back into the, you know, the, the categories of extreme, you know, unpopular and, uh, you know, unacceptable. And um, that's not something that, I mean, you know, somebody can definitely, I, I think this administration, in my opinion, has definitely allowed those ideas to come into the mainstream. But I think that a an administration that is more um, focused on following the rule of law, adhering to the Constitution, um, is going to be very hard pressed to be able to, you know, implement any kind of legislative fix, um, any type of uh, executive order to, you know, do that kind of work. That's up to us as communities you know, at the local level, at the state level to, you know, address that. And um, there was a question about Facebook and maybe we can talk about that is um, what can Facebook be doing more in order to address the, the hate speech that exists on it? The, 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 you know, it's, it's um, the government can legislate. And I think David had talked about using, you know, um, advocacy and legislation to do that. So maybe David, if you could, uh, you know, like circle back to that question um, because there, there are some First Amendment implications, but then, you know, Facebook is not a government entity. Well, and that, that's the key, right? Facebook is a private company, right? It may have shareholders, but it's a private company. And at the end of the day, um, I mean, you know, sort of the, the approach that Mark Zuckerberg has taken is that, hey, look, 40 years ago, if you called somebody and said, I'm going to kill you or called them a name, you wouldn't go after the phone company. We're just the platform through which, you know, through which people are communicating and sharing. And all of these platforms, though, have these things called user agreements. They can be stronger. They can be more, they can be enforced more widely. They can define sort of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable on their platforms, right? A lot of, I mean, there's a new, there's a new platform called Parler, which some of you may have heard about. It's gotten a lot of attention in the last week and a half, right? The reason it exists is because a lot of these people have been kicked off of Facebook and Twitter and other mainstream social media platforms. And that's where many of them are turning to. And so, you know, ADL has been at the forefront of, of fighting hate online. We went so far as three years ago, we opened up something called the Center for Technology and Society and in Silicon Valley, and we hired um, uh, a, a senior executive from Reddit to run it and who we have engineers who can sit across the table from YouTube and from Google and from Facebook and from Twitter and from insert platform here and say, you can add, and they're not, they're not civil rights attorneys, but they're engineers. They're the ones saying, we, you can change your algorithm actually. And you're not, and you, and you can push hate down. YouTube has done a lot on that end. Facebook finally has kicked David Duke off of, uh, off of its platform and has taken down and is cracking down on QAnon conspiracy theories. Twitter has been very aggressive, but there's a lot, there's a, a lot more that you know that they need to do. And basically, you know, to declare their space to be um, hate free. And we think that the same ingenuity that's changed the way we communicate needs to be used to clamp down on hate speech and misinformation um, because it is their platforms. You know, this past summer, ADL and the NAACP and Common Cause, and LULAC, and Color of Change, and a number of other organizations, civil rights groups, ran something called the Stop Hate for Profit, where we, where we talked to advertisers. More than 1,200 advertisers on Facebook pulled their ads for at least a month from Facebook, because their ads were appearing next to Holocaust deniers. Their, um, their, their Facebooks were, their, their ads were appearing next to racist racist uh, language. And so they didn't want their brands being associated with that. It ultimately prompted Facebook to do a number of different things, not far enough, but enough. It got their attention. 
Um, but regulators are paying attention as well. And so there's a regulatory pers um, perspective here too, that role, but more so is that um, we've got to hold these platforms accountable. Anybody else? So I'm going to end on um, one last question. Uh, it, it, uh, it says, are there any studies on what radicalizes people? And um, I think that uh, I, I'm going to throw this to Liz first. Um, and, and I'm going to preface it by saying that like uh, the idea of what radicalizes somebody um, can be a very, uh, you know, um, caustic, uh, you know, frame because um, people, you know, think that that's the government uh, or police policing their ideas. So um, if you could talk a little bit about that as well, that'd be great. Yeah, I, uh, I saw that there's so many more other ones here that I'd love to speak to too, but but I'm glad you threw that at me first. Um, uh, so I, I wanna start by saying, you know, unfortunately this is a really difficult question and a difficult answer. Uh, there are often people who wanna say, all right, what's the profile, right? Like, what's the checklist? How can we tell? And that just, you know, is very, very difficult. The kinds of things that we track or we're looking at theory saying, okay, if someone has some kind of vulnerability, this gets exploited by a recruiter or something like that. But, you know, those kinds of vulnerabilities like, uh, you know, being socially isolated or, you know, being a victim of trauma or abuse, those are things that happen to Unfortunately, you know, many more, much more, many more citizens than radicalized, right? It's a tiny, tiny fraction. I'm talking about, um, you know, we look at military experience. Again, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of vets who participate in any of these kinds of activities or have these ideas. Um, so, one way that we try to understand this is um, uh, in, in sort of combination pathways, right? So, if you've got someone that is experiencing this and then they get exposed to this, how is that? You know what is what is that potential to lead to? What are these sort of sequences of events? Um, and that still is really hard because, again, um, especially recently, it's happening very quickly. So it used to be that in order to get, and again, I'm using an, uh, a definition of a working definition of radicalization here that really focuses on sort of violent radicalization. But you know, you used to sort of have happen to be approached by someone in a white supremacist group and to start receiving this content and experiencing it. And now you might just be playing a video game. You might be 11 years old or nine years old playing a video game on online and start hearing stuff and, and get uh, recruited that way. Um, and then it happens very quickly, right? So I think all of the things we've talked about at the societal level are really important. Um, you know, in countering those ideas, in trying to see where they're coming from, um, trying to stop them before they get mainstreamed, right? So before they explode all over these platforms, a lot of our work is really reactive. Our work, I mean that in society generally, right? Like it's very reactive. We need to be a little bit faster at it. Um, and then again, you know, we're looking at projects uh, as to how to help individuals disengage. So those are very different questions, I think, at the societal and individual level. And I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer, but it's at the individual level, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis to some extent, but trying to reach people where they are and to help them have, you know, meet their needs in other ways. Um, so I'm sorry, that cannot be a satisfying answer. I know, I'm sorry, but that's what we have right now. I would, I would only add for, as we're living in sort of this world where we're all, you know, being stuck at home, and for those of us who are parents, um, you know, putting kids on sort of on online as a, you know, as, as one sort of form of parenting these days. Really, I think what Liz just said, um, parents have to be really aware of what your kids are looking at online, um, online video games that they're playing, and who they're talking to, and what they're being exposed to it is very much part of sort of the recruitment efforts and what kids are being exposed to. And there's language and there's terminologies that's used. Um, there's a whole nother language that's used by white supremacists online and online gaming, et cetera. Um, you can go to ADL.org and read our, our, our work on it if you want. Um, but I would just say is you gotta be really aware of what your, parent, what your kids are looking at online um, and, and be a part of that too. And I'll just add, um, I, I think, um, you know, we just see a whole lot of this because so many people 
of, of the these extremists feel threatened. They feel threatened at some level. They feel threatened by the, um, the power and authority of the government. They feel threatened by the complexion of our country changing. It's becoming more brown and tan and they feel threatened by that, um, that folks will, you know, they will no longer be in the majority. They'll be more the minority um, in, in this country. And quite frankly, I think some of, some of these folks um, are afraid that some of these folks will start um, treating them the way they've treated others in this country. That um, you know the, the the rise of population of of, of the brown and tan community will um, be seeking retribution. Um, uh, you know, based on how uh, uh, racism that has been imposed upon them. Um, and and I and I saw a really. Um, important quote and I, and I, I, I don't want to misquote it but basically it it, it, it was um, a protester at a Black Lives Matter uh, protest that specifically kind of talked about this and said that, you know we're not looking for um, revenge you, you should be glad that we're not seeking revenge we're, we're, we're seeking justice we're seeking equality and I think that's what people need to understand that you know a lot of a lot of what we're seeing in terms of protests, um, Black Lives Matter in particular, um, it, it's not about revenge, it's, it's about justice and equality. But I, I think that these, these extremists are, are just feeling threatened in so many ways that this is how they're reacting to, um, to their, their livelihood, their um, manhood. In a lot of cases, we talked about the misogyny related to a lot of this, uh, just feeling very threatened. And, and I don't know how, how to address that. I really don't. Margaret, did you have any last comments? I don't necessarily need to be the last person. Um, I also think that to somebody's question about how we get it to stop, I think it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Sometimes I actually think sometimes it's better to know where the hate is uh, because then it's easier to deal with it up front um, as opposed to being blindsided. And, and sometimes the stuff that I've read about some of this is it's almost like cult programming. I don't know if that's quite the right phrase I'm looking for, Dr. Yates, but um, I, th I think that it, it is on an individual basis, but that people are really, as Tish suggested, grasping for something that because they feel threatened and, be, and maybe boxed into a corner might be my language. And so it becomes almost cult-like. And so then you're in, in, in a realm that I'm not equipped to address, but you know, cult deprogramming. That's, that's sort of where I am with some of that, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to have to, we're going to have to leave it at that. I mean, you just, like Margaret, you opened up the topic of cults and that, that, that actually is like a fascinating area of uh, study that, you know, could, could be, you know, discussed in the context of, um, you know, uh, working with people that are seeking disengagement. Um, or, 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 or you can't leave it here. So I think the hopeful piece of this is that we're all here. David, I know, had his doubts about whether we would sustain an audience for two hours. David, we did pretty well. 28 uh, people still here. I'm right? impressed. So um, Elgin's different in some ways and, and for the good. So that's part of where I would leave it. So um, we've got Tish back on, which means that my job ends and hers begins. <laughs> I want to thank all of our panelists, Elizabeth Yates, David Goldenberg, Rabbi Margaret Frisch Klein, Tish Powell, and our moderator, Junaid Afif, and all of our attendees. You came up with great questions. Uh, David, we can actually probably go on for another two hours, but we won't. Uh, we want to give everybody uh, the rest of their Sunday afternoon. Please check uh, the resources at Gail Borden Public Library. And if you're not from this area, your own public library. Uh, because there are quite a few uh, books out there 
lots of journal articles. A lot of them are actually linked on the Southern Poverty Law Center's website. Also check out the resources of the ADL. Uh, I believe David posted the uh, website, the URLs earlier. Um, Midwest.adl.org, I believe was the main, the main address. Correct me if I'm wrong. And also look to some of our upcoming programs. On January 24th or 25th, whatever the Sunday is of that weekend, we are going to be discussing Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. And then on April 18th, we'll be, we'll be doing a discussion of Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me. Uh, so Elgin is really um, poised to dig deep into the issue of racism. And by that, I also mean how to be an anti-racist. Uh, it's all related. Um, so just be on the lookout. Uh, I think we have um, an appetite and a, and a desire to connect and engage with each other on these um, deeper topics. Um, so again, thank you all for coming, uh, for parking yourselves in front of your screens and uh, devoting two hours to uh, discussing some very important, perhaps uncomfortable uh, topics. And I apologize if we didn't get to everybody's questions, um, but the resources are out there and we can connect you. Uh, so thank you again. Um, and uh, I'm just really overwhelmed by the turnout and just uh, the perceptiveness and um, the willingness to engage and the generosity of our, our panelists and sharing their expertise and experiences. So thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>